beginning of his kingdom was Babel. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Wherefore it is said, Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? To slay the souls that should not die, and to save the souls that should not live. When reading the Bible, you will often come across people within it that are significant, yet the story seems to lack definition. The story of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel is one of these examples. Experiences like this can cause Christians to search out false Bibles and the lies of man just to satisfy their itch to know more information. However, I challenge you to understand this passage. Romans 3.4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The only way a Christian can know if they are seeing the truth is when it comes directly from the word of God. Everything outside of the Bible is a lie put forth by man to tickle the ears of the simple. Titus 1.14 warns us in saying, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Writings such as the supposed book of Enoch and the supposed book of Jasser are simply fables of the Jewish community that people look to for Christian information. It is like looking for accurate information on a conservative political candidate in the political camp of the liberals. The source of this error is a lack of faith. Christians have trouble in believing God could preserve his own word through every generation. Yet at the same time, they have no problem trusting scrolls found in a cave that were written by unbelieving Jews who rejected Christ and contradict the Bible. Through this documentary, I will show you the true history of Nimrod, the wisdom that the Lord shows to those who are willing to study scripture. To begin, we will start with the first mention of Nimrod in the Bible. Genesis 10.8 says, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. The first thing we learn about this man is that his father is Cush, and we can understand from Genesis 10.6 that Cush is the first son of Ham. If you did not know, Ham represents spiritual wickedness within the Bible. As Genesis 9 verses 22 through 27 say, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. To give you some insight, every person within the Bible has a spiritual representation of a future generation. Let's take Noah as symbolizing God the Father, and his three children symbolizing three types of people of God. Shem represents Christ, and therefore his children are the people of Israel that have faith in God, while Ham represents Satan, and therefore his children, who are symbolized by Canaan, are the people of Israel that turn from the Lord. This is why Canaan is cursed and not Ham, because God is spiritually representing the curse he will put upon the children of disobedience. We see this in Ezekiel 16, which says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother a Hittite. 
And as for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. God uses the spiritual symbolism of Canaan to describe the people of Jerusalem due to their wicked abominations. The last son of Noah, who is Japheth, then represents the Gentiles that come to God after the death of Christ. This explains why Noah's prophecy of Japheth said, He shall dwell in the tents of Shem. The Lord even explains this truth in Genesis 10 verses 2 through 5. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Mesich, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Riphtha and Togamar, and the sons of Javan, Eliash and Tarshish and Kittim and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. As you can see, God tells us that the Gentiles come out of the loins of Japheth. Now if you can understand from that story that Ham represents the spiritual wickedness and influence of Satan, then all of his offspring must have similar significance. We read in Genesis 10.6, And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Phut and Canaan. Canaan is the fourth son of Ham, meaning he represents a later generation. However, Cush is the firstborn son, and therefore he must represent the first historical generation of Ham's wickedness. And his son Nimrod would be the first kingdom of that generation. As Genesis 10 verses 8 through 10 say, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalni, in the land of Shinar. The land of Shinar is synonymous with the kingdom of Babylon, a kingdom that signifies all the spiritually wicked nations throughout the Bible, as stated in Daniel 1 verses 1 through 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. The land of Shinar is where the king of Babylon is returning to. And therefore, the kingdom of Babylon is in Shinar. And notice how we are told it is the location of the house of his God. Before we dive into Nimrod and the kingdom of Babylon, it is important to understand what this city symbolizes throughout the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jerusalem is spiritually noted as Babylon. Revelation 18 verses 21 through 24 say, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The reason the bridegroom and the bride, the prophets and the saints, are said to have died within Babylon is because it is where Jesus and his church and the prophets of the Old Testament preached to the people of God. It was in Jerusalem. To prove this further, we see in Galatians 1 verse 18 it says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. 
And then in Galatians 2, verses 7-9, through 9, it says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, and the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. We can learn from these verses that Peter is a servant of God, whose primary focus is the people of Israel at Jerusalem. We then see in 1 Peter 5, verses 12 through 13, he says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. Peter is calling the church at Jerusalem, where he is located, the church that is at Babylon. He says this to give you a heavenly definition of the people in that nation. The Jews killed Christ and then imprisoned and killed many of his disciples. Just as we read in the book of Daniel, how the people of Babylon captured the king of Israel and took his people captive. Now that you understand why the land of Shinar represents spiritual wickedness, we can explain Nimrod's kingdom, the kingdom of Babel. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 4 say, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And then in verse 9 we see, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. It was the kingdom of Nimrod that built the Tower of Babel in the land of Shinar. This is the origin of what we now know as the city of Babylon, and Nimrod is its founder. The Tower of Babel has great spiritual significance in that it represents the ideology of Satan. The people of Babel, or Babylon, were following the ideology of Satan by attempting to build their own way to heaven. We see this portrayed in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. If Satan is the god of Babel, it would make sense that he is influencing Nimrod to build a tower to heaven. The Tower of Babel is a physical representation of what Satan desired spiritually, which is to take his throne from the earth to above the stars of God. Now you may be wondering why Nimrod is called a mighty hunter in the Bible. To explain this, I must show you that hunting does not always refer to literal animals. Let's look at the context of the hunting done by Nimrod. It says in Genesis 10 verses 8 through 10, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Calneh, in the land of Shinar. Notice how these verses explain that Nimrod is a mighty hunter. Then it says he has a kingdom, and this is given to explain that from his mighty hunting, 
he has acquired this kingdom. Ezekiel 13 verse 21 says, Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. This verse is explaining that when you overcome a people, it is also called hunting them, and explains one of the reasons Nimrod is called the mighty hunter. But the word hunted also has a spiritual aspect, as we see in Ezekiel 13, verses 17 through 19. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, to slay the souls that should not die, and to save the souls alive that should not live, by your lying to my people that hear your lies? The Lord is explaining here that through the preaching of lies by the women, They are hunting souls and polluting the name of God. This is the spiritual reason that Nimrod is called a mighty hunter before the Lord. Being the first king of Babylon and establishing the Tower of Babel, it shows his spiritual influence over the souls of his kingdom. And this influence comes from the doctrine of his God, who is Satan. In Genesis 11 verses 5 and 6 it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. The scriptures are explaining that because the whole earth is of one language, they began to build the Tower of Babel. To understand this, you must understand the heavenly aspect of this thing. Zephaniah 3 verses 8 and 9 say, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured, with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord, to serve him with one consent. God does not care what dialect you call upon his name. What he cares about is that we are all of the same mind, serving the Lord in the same religion, which is the pure language of Zephaniah 3. Titus 1.15 says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice how the word pure here is referring to those who are not defiled and who believe in God, just as the pure language of Zephaniah was referring to those who call upon the name of the Lord. We see this also in James 1, verses 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious, and brittleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. In these verses, we are being told that the word pure is in terms of religion. Everything in the Bible has a heavenly purpose. Jesus often refers to people as trees to describe them spiritually. In Matthew 7, it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree 
bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus is saying that spiritually speaking, a false prophet is a corrupt tree that brings forth evil fruit. Using this description allows you to understand that the water this tree receives are not of the waters of life. Therefore, when this tree produces fruit, the fruit are evil. The heavenly aspect of this parable is that the waters which grow the tree are the doctrine it receives. The tree is the prophet, and the fruit it produces are the people that that prophet influences. Which is why most preachers today are corrupt, because they receive their water from a false Bible version. The Bible is the waters of life, and a corrupt Bible causes a tree to bear corrupt fruit. This type of symbolism can also be applied to language. As we learned in James 1, it is the tongue that is referred to as the heart. So when the tongue is deceptive, it causes an evil speech to be produced, or an evil, impure language. Proverbs 10.20 says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. This verse is using repetition to give you a spiritual description. First it says, the tongue of the just. Then it says, the heart of the wicked. It is telling you that the tongue and the heart are the same spiritual description. Just as Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Notice how the Lord is explaining that it is your heart that makes your mouth speak. The tongue is the spiritual representation of your heart, and therefore of your beliefs. It is through this member of your body that your doctrines and beliefs are manifested. With that said, when the Bible explains the people of Babel were all of one speech and language, it means they are all of one religion. Psalm 19 verses 2 and 3 say, Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. These verses are explaining that all religions of the world come from the voice of the day or from the voice of the night. To understand the day and night, let us read 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. The day is also known as the light, and darkness is also known as the night. Jesus is the light of the world, and therefore his language is that of the Lord. However, the opposite is also true, where Satan is the darkness of this world, and his language is that of the night. This is the one language referenced in Genesis 11, the language that comes from the voice of the night. Throughout this documentary, I have been explaining how Nimrod, under the influence of Satan, gathered the whole earth to Babylon to build a tower. But now you can see that the heart of the people was all joined in one language, the language of Satan. We see in Ezekiel 3, verses 5-7, through 7, it says, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Here, God is telling Ezekiel if he were sent to a people of a strange speech and language, they would have listened to him. Now, if these verses were talking about literal languages, how could the people hearken to Ezekiel when he does not speak their literal language? What God is truly saying is that if he sent Ezekiel with the gospel 
to a strange religion, they would have turned and believed the gospel. He then goes on to say, when he had sent them to Israel, who are a people supposedly of his same language, their heart is hardened to him. It is not that they don't understand Hebrew, it is that they are rejecting the doctrine or speech of the Lord. For our last portion of this documentary, we will finish the story of the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11 says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Because the people were all of the language of Babylon, which is the doctrine of Satan, they all had the same mind to build a tower to heaven. Being of the same physical language does not give you the same desires. However, being of the same spiritual language does give you the same desires. It gives you one mind. Now you can truly understand why God confounds the language of all the people. He is doing it to split up their religions. It is why we see so many different religions throughout the Bible. And even today, you have the religion of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, and so on. Though all of these false religions are listening to the voice of darkness, God has confounded the people since the Tower of Babel so they cannot agree on their beliefs. And because they cannot agree, they cannot join together in one mind. This allows the spiritual influence of Satan to have a limit. This was also true during the life of Christ, as we see in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. People during the time of Christ worshipped many different gods, and therefore they were influenced by different beliefs. However, after the death of Christ, the gospel is then spread throughout the whole world, and we see two languages begin to develop, the language of Christ and a re-emergence of the language of Babylon, which is the religion of Satan. Revelation 13, verses 4-8 through 8 say, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Notice how it is through the world worship of the dragon and the beast that they have power over the whole earth. It is through his speech that he speaks great things and blasphemes God. And after he does this, the saints are killed. An entire religion of people cannot be killed unless all other people are of the same religion. This occurred during the Roman Empire, where the whole earth worshipped Caesar, and he made a decree that all who did not worship him would be killed. Spiritually speaking, he was trying to make the whole earth of one language through the influence of the dragon. 
I do not want to go too deep into the end times prophecy that was accomplished throughout the 40-year period after the death of Christ. The purpose of bringing up the Roman Empire was to show you how once the earth is of one mind to worship the beast, the final spiritual Babylon arose in Jerusalem. My next documentary will cover this topic in depth. It is simply another proof that through the uniting of the religions into the language of the dragon, it caused spiritual Babylon to begin again. To conclude, I pray this documentary was able to give you insight into Nimrod, the Tower of Babel, and the spiritual representations of Babylon within the Bible. It was through religion that a single king such as Nimrod was able to hunt the whole earth and bring them to Babel. Because of this, we can learn a great deal about the last days after the time of Christ, and I will cover this subject more in depth in my next documentary. I thank you for watching this documentary, and if you grew spiritually, please share it with others and consider supporting our ministry. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and guide you in wisdom.